um, a long. Uh, my name is Brandy. I'm the Chief Program Officer for ACT for Alexandria. I'm excited to welcome you to uh, the second part of a two-part series. So many of you were with us back in November, which seems like a really long time ago, um, where we invited Susan to come share about how do we prepare for year-end giving. And you all received some resources and planning and worked in small groups um, to kind of identify the strategies that you were going to incorporate uh, for a successful year-end campaign. And so now your end is over and it's time to talk about what do we do? Um, I think we think about this a lot with Spring to Action too. It's like we work so hard towards this goal, we meet the goal and we just wanna like take a breather and move on to the next thing. But the next thing is how do we engage these donors uh, year round and steward them and cultivate them uh, for, for your organizations. And so I'm excited to turn it over to Susan, who is a good friend of Act for Alexandria and a lot of the other nonprofits here in the city. Um, she is an incredible fundraising expert. Um, she has a lot of creative ideas, lots of practical things, and she's really, really interested in helping you be successful in stewardship and retention. And so I will go ahead and turn it over to Susan. And just a heads up, we are recording this um, and we will have a breakout session as well. Um, and so for those who are always furiously trying to take notes, we will send a copy of the slides afterwards. So Susan, welcome. Thank you, Brandy and Molly, and certainly my friends at Actra Alexandria, I'm happy to be here. I see some faces that were similar to our kind of part one session back in December. And I'm excited to meet all of you. As Brandy said, I'm a fundraising consultant. I work exclusively with nonprofits on their fundraising programs. Um, I've been on my own about eight years. I've worked with many amazing organizations, including quite a few in Alexandria, and have really kind of uh, enjoyed becoming a local philanthropy expert as it pertains to our giving here and our various donors and funders. So I'm really excited to talk to you about it uh, today, our topic, which was harnessing your year end giving success, what I hope was a successful effort, um, and turning that into a year round stewardship and donor retention plan. So let me just start uh, by sharing my screen. So just bear with me as I do this technical thing. Okay. I believe you all can see this. I hope that you can see this. Um, we have a large group today, which is really exciting. But I think what that also means is that there's better ways for us to interact with each other. So let me just kind of start the presentation. We have a couple ground rules at the beginning that I think will help facilitate today's session. So just quickly, and if you were on last time, you saw this from me, oops. Um, if you could please mute yourself, I would appreciate it. If you are somewhere where you can put your camera on, I always appreciate a camera, particularly when we go into breakout groups. I think your group would appreciate if they could see you. It's just a nice way of interacting. And um, I would say be open to new ideas. I often find that when I go in and work with nonprofits, it's this is what we do. This is, these are the things we do every single year. And I think that's fantastic. Oftentimes, some of those plug and play pieces, knowing when you do your stewardship and your annual report, those are the same. I think you'll also hear ideas today that will stretch you a bit. And I think that's the goal of today's session is to think more broadly, more personally about how we steward donors. So I would say, please be open to new ideas, be an active participant in your breakout group. I've done a number of trainings now for ACT and always the surveys that came back that said, my favorite part was being able to interact with my peers and having that small group discussion. So I hope that you are an active participant in that. Also, we're going to use the chat box quite a bit. There may be 30, 40, 50 people that show up today. So in lieu of kind of raising hands, and I won't be able to see you when we may miss you, as we go through some of the introductory slides and you have questions, pose them in the chat box. If you're on the phone so you can't do the chat box, I think at some point, feel free and kind of pipe in if you do have a question. And we're definitely going to reserve time at the end of the session to be able to take all the lingering questions that you may have until we reach our time limit, which is 1.30 today. 
And then also as the presenter, it's nice sometimes to see the Zoom reactions. If something sounds good, give me a thumbs up. If you got a question, you can use that icon. Um, but those are just a couple of the ground rules to get us started. Oh, and regarding the chat box, Brandy and Molly are gonna do a really great job monitoring that for me because I can't see it as well when I'm um, doing the presentation. So thanks for bearing with us if we don't get to it right at that second. So just a bit of introductions and maybe right now, just a show of hands for the folks that are on the screen and I would appreciate it. Um, I told you a little bit about myself. I'd love to know generally who's on the call, who um, is the um, executive director or CEO of a nonprofit organization? Just by show of hands, hands up. Okay, um, do we have any board members on? People that are serving in a board capacity for a nonprofit right now, okay. And then how about fundraising staff? If you would classify yourself as like kind of fundraising communications marketing staff, okay. Um, and then do we have any other staff members of nonprofits that are not classified as CEO or fundraising? All right, great. Any volunteers that are brave and are doing this out of the goodness of your heart and passion for your organization? I applaud you. Um, anyone on here, just because I'm curious looking at the size of organization, anyone on here that feels like a one-stop shop, you're the one and only for your organization. Okay, we got a nice mix. It's nice to see you guys. I know we all bring a very different perspective when we come to conversations like this. Um, a kind of across my work professionally with nonprofits, I work with all types. I work with certainly with boards on their fundraising roles and responsibilities, with development committees, with CEOs on how they lead an organization, with development staff on what are the best strategies, with volunteers on how to engage. So I appreciate all of you being here today. I hope you come and you learn something new. So I thought it would be neat just so I can understand because we're gonna talk first about year-end giving. On a scale of one to five, five being excellent, you're very happy, how would you rate your organization's donor stewardship plan? And what I mean when I say stewardship is how well do you do at thanking them, acknowledging them and keeping them engaged? How would you rate your organization's plan? If you put it in the chat box, one through five, five being the absolute best, let's give everyone a minute to enter in their, their number. And Brandy, I will leave it to you to announce our findings when they appear. Yeah, we have a lot of threes. Um, we have one four, two fours, some 3.5s. We had a couple twos, a one to two. Um, yeah, so I would say we're looking in the, the three range if we were okay. to do average. Okay, so three is good, right? But whatever number you put, we can grow from. I find that a lot of times when I ask that question one-on-one -on -one of nonprofits, what's your stewardship plan? I'll get a lot of responses like, well, we send out the tax acknowledgement letter, right? Like at a very base level, we got our letters out and I'm like, that's fantastic. We can build on that. And really what stewardship is, is it's about just like how we plan out our fundraising. I know the annual report goes out this month. I'm gonna do solicitations in November and March. We also build in stewardship to that mix. And stewardship really is the way that we retain our donors and we increase the size of those donations, which is why it's worth its own separate line item in our fundraising plan, stewardship. So I do think that at the end of today's session, you will have a much more clear idea of what a robust stewardship plan looks like. Okay, continuing on. It's important to start with the donor cycle. So stewardship, as I said at the beginning, it's thank you and it's gift, gift acknowledgement, but it's much, much more than that. So this is the general, there's so many cycles. You guys have probably seen this in various iterations. Sometimes it's more circles or less circles, but essentially this is the donor cycle. We start first with the identification of the donors. Who are these donors? We research them sometimes, we qualify them and try to decide, do we think that they're a good prospect for our organization? 
Then we move on to the cultivation, right? That's where most of the time happens in the cultivation phase. And we'll get into that in a minute. But essentially, it's all the things you do to build a relationship with that donor or to provide them with information so you find out how interested they are. But all of those activities are to get you to a point where you can solicit a donation, right? So we always want that end goal of soliciting the donation in there because if we don't ask, we don't raise any money. And then now starts the stewardship, which I know there's a circle that says steward. Steward really begins right at the point of the gift. So there's the acknowledgement. Acknowledgement is sometimes formal. It's I'm gonna send you your tax letter and it's gonna have the IRS language, whatnot. But there's also thank you emails, personal phone calls, note cards, lots of ways to steward and personally thank donors. Then there's the engagement. Then we want to keep them going. We don't want to lose them at that point. There's a lot of instances where I've gone into nonprofits where it's actually that donor, maybe they got a couple of e-newsletters, but they didn't really hear from us in a personal way until it's November and we're asking you for money again. That's the cycle we're trying to break. I'm gonna tell you right up front, it takes time, it takes energy, it takes some strategy, but we work so, so hard to get new donors. And then if we don't steward them right, they're never coming back. So the best thing that we can do is retain as many donors as possible. And that's done through acknowledgement, continuous engagement and stewardship until we're ready to solicit again, right? So I would even draw a straight line from stewardship to solicitation again, because this is how we wanna keep the cycle going. If there's any questions on that, feel free and put them in the chat box. Okay. One of the main reasons for stewardship is that it absolutely improves retention. So retention is like your 2019 donors, did you get them back by the end of 2020? And some nonprofits don't measure on a calendar year like that, maybe you're measuring on your fiscal year, but did you retain them to the next year, right? So I don't know if you know this, maybe by show of hands, tell me if you do. Nationally, donor retention is abysmal. It's really low, okay? And these are the stats that are continuously hindering nonprofit staff and volunteers because we think, God, why are we losing so many donors? So on average, average donor retention, 46% year over year. That means if you had 100 donors in 2019, you only got 46 of them back in 2020. There's nobody that's going to be happy with that percentage, right? We work very hard. Um, first time donors, it's even less, right? Think about, you ask your board, please, will you send this email out? Will you personalize this? Will you access your networks? If we don't do a good job stewarding, we can only expect 23% back the next year. Repeat donors is higher. And you might be thinking, why would repeat donors be higher? And I think a lot of you guys know, a lot of repeat donors that are on recurring donations, they're giving how? Via credit card. It's a lot harder to like call or email and be like, please stop charging me every single month. We always love it when our donors, hopefully we're stewarding them and they truly do want to keep giving every month, but sometimes they forget that they're even on your cycle. Right, so repeat donors and the retention of those donors is higher. And that also goes for monthly donors. Monthly donors, much higher. That's my example of maybe donating every month. Repeat donors, meaning did, you, did they give to you like let's say twice or three times? The more times they give to you, the more stewarded they will be to your organization and your work and the, thus the more likely they're to give again. So you see the first hump is first time. If we can treat those first timers really personally, really well, cultivate them and engage them and get them to give twice, all of a sudden your chances of getting the third, fourth, fifth gift go up. So just take this snapshot in your mind. And I know um, Brandy's got the PDF for everyone and perhaps it went around or will go around right after this, but keep that in mind. Why do we steward? Why do we ask board members to make calls? Why do we hand personalize thank you notes? It's to combat this. That's why. So this is a little overview of our plan for today. For the folks that were in part one of this in December, it will feel familiar. 
Um, it, but it will be a little different in that instead of doing last time we did kind of like lots of mini breakout groups to kind of tackle topic by topic. This one, we're going to review all the topics together first. And then we're going to do one group breakout. You'll have about five or six people in your group and you'll really get to get into like what is a really good thoughtful discussion, I believe. So the first section today, we're going to talk about analyzing your year end fundraising results. Now, anyone else just by show of hands, do you feel like mail is significantly delayed and you're still getting envelopes, right? It was like the word I'm still getting Christmas cards that were mailed at the beginning of December. So it's a little scary. Hopefully they all find the way to your nonprofit. But we're gonna analyze year-end fundraising results of which I would imagine some of you have already started. Of course, we're all keeping an eye on the best number, which is how much money have we raised. There's actually quite a bit more as you would imagine that goes into analyzing. Then we're gonna do an overview where I'll provide you with context and information on what are the key elements of stewardship. And then we're gonna do what's kind of the next section. Um, I've developed a template, which I believe everyone got. Did you get the word template that looks like a bunch of boxes and we're going to fill it in? Okay, awesome. I'm going to review the template. Hopefully you're going to have it up on your screen so that as you're in your breakout session, which as I said, we'll probably have about 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes in the breakout, which it might sound like a long time. I can promise you it's not. My goal for that breakout session is that you review the template together with your group. You start to plug in your ideas, you take great ideas and you discuss with your peers. And then at the end, when we come out, we'll do a debrief and I will be able to answer questions for you. And then we'll have a little time to do kind of closing thoughts and next steps for me, which is based on where you are now, here's what I would do if I were you kind of after today's session. So this is the overview. Um, and I know Brandy said in the chat box, if anyone didn't get the template, let her know and she will send it to you. Alrighty. So starting first with year end results. And let me actually, if you guys would just participate with me for just a second again, scale of one to five. One being the worst year end giving you've ever had and five being the best year end giving you've ever had. And maybe that's just your total year end giving. Not just revenue, but like how you feel like you did. One being bad, five being excellent. Stick it in the chat box. How would you rate your organization's year-end fundraising? All right, we're seeing, let's see, a range. Um, I see a lot of fours, I see a lot of fives. Um, I see a three, um, a two, but I would say in, um, mostly fours and fives, which is exciting. That's good. Um, and if you wanna put any kind of qualifiers in there in the chat box, that would be great, but kind of across the board, my experience with my clients, my former clients who always check in with me and we talk quite a bit about year end giving is that it was a pretty good year for year end giving. A lot of nonprofits I talk with, they did well. And there's a lot of reasons that that could be. It could be a social services organization. It could be an organization that's really pivoted and addressed COVID related type impacts. Um, you could be particularly relevant at the moment, uh, a really great philanthropic case that seems new and different. Um, I have also, though, talked with some organizations where they just have really struggled to find their relevance, their continued relevance in an increasingly competitive fundraising environment brought on by COVID and everything else. So, but generally, I found people have had good um, good fundraising years. And I certainly hope that you did. And if you didn't, and you've got questions about why you didn't stick it in the chat box or email me afterwards, and I would be happy to kind of address them that way. Okay. So if you were in my first session, you know that I harp a lot on donor segments, which is the idea that we 
message, we communicate, we engage, and we solicit donors differently based on the level of their giving or their level of potential. Meaning that it's really easy to send out one letter to absolutely everybody, right? That's not how you raise major gifts. It's just not. That's how you keep an annual fund going. I have no doubt that your organization will do a great job at $10 gifts and $25 gifts and 50 and 100, sending out the one letter that's the same. And this isn't me criticizing. This is me saying for any nonprofit that wants to grow fundraising, the way you do that is by stratifying your donor segments. And the higher you get on your pyramid, the more personal and um, timely and frequent your method of engagement with them is. That's how we raise major gifts. Each and every time, that's how it happens. And I've got a lot of nonprofits that reach out and they say, oh gosh, my board tells me I have to grow my fundraising revenue by 50% this year. Well, I can promise you that's not done by just adding a mailing. That's done by prioritization and personalization. So this is one way that your donor segments could look. Now there's others, but at a base level, there's your annual fund, which I will just classify as kind of like your lower level donors. Maybe they give to you once a year, maybe a couple times a year, but generally smaller gifts, right? That's most people. Then you go into mid-level, which is you have probably heard by now and maybe not, Mid-level is the forgotten level. For many nonprofits, it's all they can do to handle just an annual fund level and the couple of major donors that they have or want to have, right? Mid-level, what they say about mid-level is if you treat mid-level like annual fund, they will behave like annual fund. If you treat them and start to work them up the pyramid towards major level, you provide them with a little bit of personal attention and some context on why giving bigger is helpful, they could perform at a major level, right? That's why I break that out. Annual, mid-level, and then major level. The higher you get on the pyramid, the less prospects and donors you have. Because we know, and I know, that you don't have the bandwidth to treat 500 people really personally. You maybe have the bandwidth to treat 30 to 40 people really personally. So the higher we get on this, the more personal the approach comes and the more time it takes, right? With those individuals. The other thing that I'll say is for some people, for some nonprofits, the vast majority of your donors are individuals. For some, you've got foundations, corporations, organizations, others. I generally segment not based on donor type, like those individuals, corporations, foundations, organizations, I segment based on giving amount or giving potential. So as I look at this major level, if I was still the director of development at a nonprofit, which was my role before I became a consultant, I would probably have some foundations in that mix, some companies or some organizations in that mix based on the amount of money that they gave to us annually. So that's one thing that I'll say. And then at the top, you see special circumstances because there are always special circumstances. There's your board members, for instance. Those should be the people that are most in the know. And they may or may not be. But we also have to remember, they're donors. They should be our best external advocates. And then there's also connectors. People in the community, and hopefully we all have some of these, that are helpful to us. Maybe they give at lower levels or at a major level. But really, their true benefit is that they can connect us and give us access. So I treat those people also kind of differently. And as we get a little bit more down into the presentation, you'll see that I've got other segments too. You may do a really good job tracking your recurring donors, right? People that give to you more than once a year or your first time donors or your lapse donors. There's always various segments, but at a base level, these are the segments that I believe you should have. Okay. By show of hands, how many nonprofits on this call think about donors within segments? Okay, kind of. How many people are kind of like, I got everyone and then I got a couple of people I treat specially? Okay, 
That's the most common one I find. Like there's always some stratification in your mind, whether you know you're doing it or not. It's like, oh, if that person gives, I know I call, right? But start to think about it a little bit more um, like this, more segments that we can track year over year. Okay. So performance overview. This is usually what we in the nonprofit world at a very high level, this is how we analyze year end, right? And it's not always the expensive, expenses part. We look at gross revenue because that's the most exciting number, right? Number of gifts, gross revenue, how much did you bring in through the mail or through online? But really we need to look at performance. Gross revenue minus your direct expenses as it relates to that fundraising activity equals net revenue. So a lot of times this comes into play, I find at year end or with any kind of appeal or mailing strategy, which is, okay, we always do the one letter. What if we added in a holiday card? There's a direct expense to that. The production of the card, the mailing of the card, the remittance, you know, postage that we post. That's why you have to track this way because it shows you, was it worth it or not? Now, not everything is about tracking just the monetary value. I care very much about how much you raise. I also care how well you are engaging your community, right? So that holiday card, it may not get you the best net, but if your community loves it, there's a reason to do it if you can afford it, of course. But keep this in mind and always track those expenses. Okay, now this is a lot, but here are things that when I work with nonprofits or when I was the director of development, here are things that I'm looking at and I'm thinking about. So, and I don't look at it just on like overall year end giving, because most people, they do a couple things with year end giving. Maybe you do like one letter, one email. Maybe you do one letter, three email. Maybe you do two mailings, a card, and seven emails, right? Everyone is a little bit different in terms of what does their year-end giving strategy look like. But I like to take it this, look at these types of things in just a big old spreadsheet, right? And I like to look at them. How many gifts did that email get me versus that other email versus that letter, right? So it's by activity. But you can also look at it by donor segment. So let me just review some of the criteria and please in the chat box put a few of questions. So the first is gross revenue. We know what that means. That's without the expenses. Then there's net revenue, which is with the expenses taken out. We all know it's a lot cheaper to send an email than it is to send a letter. But we got to see how your letter performs before we know. There's a reason people still do direct mail. And it's because for a lot of organizations, it works. If that works for your donor base, you need to figure out a way to still include some element of mailed pieces. But if it doesn't resonate with your community, then we can rethink that. What is the total number of donors that you had from that activity? Gifts secured, right? So sometimes that's different. Sometimes donors will give multiple times and sometimes they'll just give one gift. So I always kind of like to take a look at that to see if I had any repeat donors at year end that gave multiple times, maybe in reaction to my November 1 appeal, and then maybe in reaction to my December 31 appeal. What was your response rate? How many responses did you get based on that one activity? And then this gets into some really good stuff. How many donors did you retain? Meaning your year end appeal helped retain donors from 2019 that had not given yet in 2020. How many of those did you get? Did you reactivate any donors? Meaning they gave in 2018 or some other year, not in 2019, but they're back in 2020, right? That's also worth taking a look at. Did you get lapsed donors back? My personal opinion, and I guess you guys would probably agree, this has been a tough year for absolutely everyone on the planet. And if you're willing to go back and give to a nonprofit that you haven't given to in a few years or give to them for the first time, that deserves really extra special stewardship, right? That gift really means a lot regardless of the size. So let's keep that in mind as we kind of move forward. And then what I always like to look at 
Upgrade, downgrade, same. Did they give you more than they usually give you, less, or was it basically the same? We want to look at that. That tests a lot of things. Was it the year? Was it this year that made them give more? Was it the messaging? Was it the timing of the appeal? There's a lot of things we can analyze, but just generally, upgrade, downgrade, same. Average gift, average major gift, online gift percentage. I have a lot of clients that are already telling me we got way more gifts online than we usually get. We usually get a lot more envelopes in the mail, um, but this year it was way more online. And then did you have some undeliverables and some unsubscribes? So these are some metrics that I look at. Now, certainly there are many more, um, but as I think about how did my year end go, I'm looking at these, but they all are based once again on the segments. Like if you did a personalized major donor letter and then the mail house sent out the rest, I would measure those two separately. They're different. Those are different activities with different levels of engagement and personalization. And then there's qualitative analysis. It's all the other stuff, stuff that we're not tracking metrics wise. The first I'll say is, how was your timing, right? The vast majority of nonprofits nationally, they get their first year end appeal out in November. And that's a mailing or an email, but it's something that talks about giving it year end. How many people got it out in November? Okay. How many people got their first appeal out in December? All right. How many people sent out an email on either December 29th, 30th, or 31st? Kudos to you if you did. Lots and lots of donors. I, I can't remember. In my first presentation, I even made a note and pulled that stat, like the number of donors that give on December 31st, right? So for me, year-end giving, it's not an activity. It's a season. It begins sometime around early, mid-November, and it goes through 1159 on December 31st. And I plan a series of things. And if you were here in the first session, like we talked a lot about that. What are you going to do week by week? So the first thing that I want you to think about as your year in giving is how was your timing? Were you spot on? Were you too late? Did you want that letter to actually hit two weeks before? Did you follow through till the very end? The next one is what message messages resonated or did it? And I think a lot of that is people will tell you, they'll be like, oh, I really love that story. I love how you guys expressed your need this year for support or did it fall flat? Does anyone have any questions or could provide feedback or examples? Do you feel like, like, does anyone feel like I really hit the nail on the head this year? I had a great message and I think it worked. By show of hands or in the chat box, does anyone want to share that? And it's good to be proud. Okay, oops. I'm gonna keep on giving and keep on providing info until you guys stop me. The next is, did your volunteers engage? So a lot of times, of course, we ask the board. It's like, hey, we're sending out this email. Could you please forward this email around? Or development committee or key volunteers or whoever it is. Did you participate in some way? So oftentimes I find when you've got a good campaign together, a good year end giving season together, you make it really easy. You give them the template, you ask them concrete instructions. Can you do this? That they are more likely to participate. So that's another qualitative analysis piece, which is did people participate? And the last one I have, although it's certainly not the only other qualitative analysis piece, is did you get shares and likes? Did it look, does it look like your online stuff was successful? Did people share your messages? Did they like your messages? Was it more or less than previous years? So what kind of feedback do you guys have? And I see a few things in the chat box. 
So Mary Lee says that client testimonials really work. And I know testimonials look different for every organization, depending on the services or programs you provide. How many people here utilize testimonials in some fashion and feel like they're effective? Great. And then Valerie says that the response to rallying, um, rallying around our staff during COVID really resonated. That's, I, I love hearing that because my experience has been the same that people want to support the organizations they've always supported, right? Like if you have really good loyal donors, they don't just care about the programs you run, they care about you. They wanna know you're doing well. And I do agree that a function of that is they care about your staff, how your staff's doing, has everyone adapted? How are people faring? How have they pivoted? How are we supporting them? That I agree um, has been a message that has worked very well for some of my um, clients that have COVID related type work. Are you doing diaper banks? Are you still trying to provide some sort of in-person? Are you providing um, any services that feel like they're alleviating uh, community needs that are happening now because of COVID? People really care about that staff that are putting themselves out there that are still continuing this very, very important work. So I agree. That's a message that I have seen and feedback that I've received that that has really worked well. Okay. So now that's year end giving. You'll notice that I didn't put that in the template that I um, had sent around to you guys. Not because it's not that I don't want you to do that analysis, I do. Analysis is ongoing. We're still waiting on mail. I would encourage you put that in a spreadsheet and try to track what you can so that you're tracking the same types of metrics year over year, even if this year is the year that you start tracking additional metrics beyond just your gross revenue and your number of gifts. Okay. So now it's about developing your year round stewardship plan, which is really the meat of today. So the first is identifying stewardship activities, right? So those are, what are the things that we do to steward people? So the first, as you know, and I've put it again, is the donor segment. I am gonna encourage you, and through the template, this is what it will naturally lend you to do, which is coming up with stewardship activities that are different for some segments. So those are the segments on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, I have, what are the categories? So in my mind, stewardship falls into these categories. There's your gift acknowledgement, right? And that might mean the tax letter. That might mean the personal thank you call. That might mean uh, the board sending emails, right? There's a number of things you can imagine, but you can even see how I stratify that. At a base level annual fund, you get the tax acknowledgement letter. If you're mid-level, you get the tax acknowledgement letter plus a signature. If you're major level, you get the tax acknowledgement letter plus the signature plus a phone call. That's one example of how we stratify stewardship based on the donor segment. So donor recognition. Do we recognize our donors? So it may mean that at the base level, everyone's name is in the annual report. And at a mid-level, we also list our mid and major level donors um, on our website, or we provide them with some other cool recognition. We send them a memento or a plaque. At a major level, maybe they get all of those things, plus we do a testimonial. Hello, ex-donor, you've been so supportive of us. Um, we, would, we believe that your story and your reason for giving would inspire others to give. Would you be willing to give us a couple sentences that we could promote on social media in our next newsletter? And maybe that's how you start your donor testimonial spotlight, for instance, right? That's another stratification and that's a form of donor recognition. And then the next, and I think this is important, which is informative communications. We know that in order to keep donors going and stewarded and willing to hopefully give again, that we need to constantly be informing them about the work that we're doing, 
It needs to feel timely. It needs to feel relevant. It's not enough to just get, you know, the annual report that says this is all the things we did last year. Like we want timely updated communications that may be mailed, emailed, social media. Um, it may also be, and this kind of goes into the next one, cultivation. By show of hands, how many nonprofits since COVID have instituted some sort of virtual Q&A or town hall or the ability to like get online and engage with you and hear about what's happening and ask questions? Okay, awesome. So those are so successful, I have found. I have yet to see one that wasn't successful, frankly. And if you have had trouble with, with an avenue like that, reach out to me afterwards, we can chat about it. But that is informative. It's also cultivation. And sometimes nonprofits, donors, whether they know it or not, they're being cultivated. Any touch point is another notch in your stewardship belt that ties them to you closer. I was just on with another client this morning that is thinking about, gosh, I'd really love to find out what message re messages resonate with our donors, what kind of communications they want more. And I was like, after you get through January stewardship, why don't we do an online survey, five or six questions of your donors and your community members that have engaged with you sometime in the last two years. And let's ask them multiple choice, true, false type things. You know, what messages resonate with you the most? What would be content you would be more interested in seeing? Um, you know, what type of testimonial or story do you want to hear from us? How would you rate our communications? How would you rate our fundraising? And of course, it all is accompanied by an email that says, we value you so much. We appreciate you so much. We always want to do better. Right. So I have some clients, they do a survey once or twice a year. And it's so informative because you're asking them not for a gift, but it's yet another stewardship slash cultivation activity to get their advice. And then solicitation, solicitations and asking and ensuring that asking continues. It is yet another way to steward donors and to continue that relationship. Okay. So next is your timeline. So between the previous slide that we talked about and this timeline, this is what's going to set the stage for what we're going to do in breakout groups. So I like to think about the timeline in two sections, existing. And we've talked about that. Like there's things you do every year, right? I call that plug and play, right? It's pretty much ready. You know the timing around it that works well for you. And my examples of that are, for instance, if you have a monthly e-newsletter or a quarterly e-newsletter or whenever you do your e-newsletter, right? You know that's basically the first Monday of the month. That's plug and play. That goes into your timeline, right? And then when you put it into the timeline on the template, you're going to think, which donor segments does that go to? In my mind, that goes to everybody, right? That's the base level. That's the annual fund level. Do you do quarterly social media donor testimonials or videos? Right, people love that. Like more and more in a virtual world, we like want the 20 second video. We want to see the photo and the testimonial. We're online a lot more. Do you do your annual report? Right, a lot of organizations, by show of hands, how many people do an annual report of some kind? And hands down, how many people still mail their annual report? Okay, how many people are exclusively digitally sending out an annual report? Okay, so you know that at some point, if you do an annual report, that's another plug and play. We're gonna do it. Now, what I'll tell you is a lot of people, depending on your fiscal year, like the annual report, that's a cultivation technique. Do they know it? I, I, they may or they may not know it, but we're preparing them. We're reporting on success. Then we go right into some cultivation in October, and then we're asking you in November. That's how the fundraiser mind thinks, is it's all a sequence of stewardship. Next, do you do a donor thank you event? So before COVID, we all did a lot of fun little events and it was super fun and they were in person, but a lot of organizations do some sort of donor thank you, 
maybe that's all virtual now or done differently. But a lot of people, if you do have a donor thank you event, you know basically when you do that. That's plug and play. And then we all know spring to action. And I, I believe everyone on here has utilized spring to action. Maybe this will be your first year. This year, in case it's not on your calendars yet, mark it for April 28th. Um, that's another stewardship technique. Engaging people through the messaging of Spring to Action, rallying your external supporters and third-party fundraisers, and actually doing the giving day, that's stewardship and will help tie your donors to you. And Spring to Action, whether you know it or not, what a great time of year to do something like that. You're out of your end giving, you've done your stewardship, you've done a good job informing people, and it's time again. You should be asking for a gift again in the spring. And this is nicely placed, in my opinion. So it may be that, and for every organization, you came in here knowing this is what I do for stewardship. That's existing plug and play. I encourage you now to think about what else new. And you may say, I cannot do all these. There is no way. I would say, can you pick one new thing per quarter to do stewardship wise? Or can you further, further personalize your stewardship one to two ways? I'm not saying you have to do everything. No one has the bandwidth to do everything, but here are a few ideas if you did wanna plug them. Quarterly program updates. This has been probably the single most impactful thing I have seen that has helped to provide informative programmatic communications to mid and major donors that I have seen turn into more money. So what I mean by that, a quarterly program update for major donors. You've got your group of like 20 to 30 people you wanna treat a little bit differently. You are gonna send them the first quarterly email update. You're gonna say, we've started on you know, a new communications geared exclusively towards some of our best supporters of which you, Joe, are one of those people. Once a quarter, I'm going to be sending you a brief email that's got the highlights from our programs from that quarter, what we've got coming up, and invites you to engage in a conversation. Whether they want to or not, they're going to get used to getting that. And the key with that is consistency. You just do it. Once per quarter, you send them a brief email, a couple of programmatic bullets and highlights, a couple of kind of like insider info items that wouldn't appear in your normal newsletter going to everyone, right? Something like that is an excellent way of stewarding mid and major donors that feels reasonably linked, not too hard to execute, and something that you could hopefully plug into your stewardship timeline. The next is an October thankathon. So, Year end giving usually starts in November, right? A lot of nonprofits that I've worked with have either instituted or have started stewardship calls to thank donors and prepare them for year end giving. It's not an ask, it's a thank you. And it, it, it works really well in September, October, fall's been started, you wanna call a select group. And in my mind, that select group, if we're just thinking from donor segments, mid-level donors, major level donors, first time donors from last year that maybe gave a hundred bucks or more and lapsed mid and major donors that were trying to get back from a year or two before, right? Like that's just how my mind would work to think about what is our distribution list for something like that. And then you draft the template, you get some people to help make calls and you call them just to say, I just wanna thank you so much for your support of our organization last year. Um, we've, got, we've had a really exciting fall. We've got a lot going on. In the coming weeks, you'll be seeing the beginnings of our year-end campaign. You know, we hope that you'll consider making a gift. It's not an ask, it's a prep for an ask. That is an excellent stewardship technique I've seen work really well. And then uh, for the people that raised their hands and did some sort of virtual town halls, I've got a lot of my clients in a twice a year cycle now. We're doing them basically in September to set the stage to be part of that stewardship cycle leading up to year-end giving. And then I've got a lot that are, I'm already working on planning that are January and February. This is how we ended up. This is what's coming up, but it's also a nice touch point, right? Virtual town hall. And that may be for just major level, 
That means B for mid and major and first timers that look like really promising. And then thinking about first time donors, as I said, first time donor retention was like the absolute pits, like 28%, right? What can we do to engage those first time donors after they make their first gift? So for a lot of clients I work on, okay, we know that they made their first gift, so they're interested at the moment. We need to capitalize on that initial interest and put something together. So here's one example, a three-part email call series. So maybe the first email after they get their tax acknowledgement, right? Because we know base level that goes to everyone is a welcome to my organization. I am so happy to have you as a first time donor. I wanted to send you this to provide you a little bit more background of, on the work that we do. Here's some links, here's a short video, here's a fact sheet. You know, don't forget to follow us on social media and then you give them all this stuff, right? So happy to have you. Please let me know if you have any questions. That could be email one. Email two could be, can't believe it's been a month since your first donation. This is all that we've been up to in the last 30 days that your donation has gone to support, right? Here's, an op here's a virtual opportunity to engage with us. Here's a testimonial from one of our clients just wanted to say thanks again. You know, look forward to hearing any questions you have. And then maybe the third part of that is that they get included in the October Thankathon. I noticed that you made your first time donation this year. I really appreciate it. We're about to go into our year end giving. Would appreciate if you would consider making another gift. Do you see how that's kind of like a stewardship arc? It informs, it thanks, it continues to engage them in a way that feels personal and relevant to them being of that donor segment, a first time donor. By show of hands, does anyone treat their first time donors special or different in any way? Okay, that's one super easy way, you know? We can draft those emails and they can be ready. We can hopefully plug them into our CRM so that as soon as that 30 day mark hits, they get part two of the email, right? Or they get part one of the email seven days after their first gift. So that's where the technology, the tools, the infrastructure, that's where that part goes into play. And I know for many organizations, that's a challenge. We don't trust our database. We don't upgrade Intel but have that be hopefully another part of what we're thinking about. Susan, can you talk about like best practices when it comes to doing that for first time donors? Is it like a 10, I, I'm thinking about spring to action specifically. Sure. Um, are you doing that for $10 donors or are you only doing that for like your $100 donors? How do you determine, um, or do you have different kind of strategies depending on the amount that someone donates for a first time gift? Because some of it can be plug and play. Like, here's the e email template that I've drafted for 2021 that's going to go to all first time donors. It's informative, it provides the links, it gives background. I see no reason that can't go to every first time donor one week after their first donation, right? The second one, if you want to do it on a more personalized level, maybe you do assign a dollar amount. First time donors of 50 or more get email too. And then first time donors of 100 or more get part three, which is the call. So you can stratify in that way, but if you can make some of those easy and plug and play, I would encourage you to send to as many first time donors as possible. Also, because just generally from a personal level, from as being a donor myself, if you were willing to give to a brand new nonprofit, even since COVID, you deserve a little something special. That's my personal opinion, but it's been a tough year for folks. And if you got added to someone's donor, you know, giving, gosh, I would thank them in the best way you can. Okay. Okay, so we are about to go into breakout groups and I'm gonna walk you through the template in just a second. Let me just do a time check. Okay, um, two things I want, you to do as you're in the breakout groups. Discuss each section of the template together with your group and you can fill it out as you go. Now, some people like me, I am like, I have 12 screens open and I can type and chat and take my notes and whatever. If you're not that person and you can't fill it out as you go, you just wanna jot down your ideas, that's totally fine too. Make the template what it is for you. 
Um, I'm going to pop into the groups and to kind of answer questions. So it may be that during the course of your conversation, you think I'm going to save that one for Susan and ask her when she gets in here. I will jump into each group within the next 25 minutes. Molly, did you hear that, please? <laughs> Could we set breakout groups for 25 minutes? And let me now, really quick, I want to show you the template before I send you off. Okay, so I did this in Word, but just so you know, my life and the way I track things, it exists in Excel. But for the purposes of doing a template for you all, hopefully making it helpful, I've put it into Word. But you can probably see how all of this could easily be copy and pasted into Excel. So these are the categories that I'd love for you to talk with your group about. What are your donor segments, right? Try to assign some parameters. Annual fund, $1 to 49. Or maybe for some of you, it's $1 to 499. And then notes. I know my annual fund. I got about this many donors. This is where I know I need to find them. The notes is whatever you need to know so that you go look for these people when you get back into your database or into your donor list. And you may not have all these segments, or you may. You may have different segments. I didn't even say that you know you want to treat differently. This is for you to make of it what you will. And then what are your stewardship activities, right? We talked about the different sections, gift acknowledgement, donor recognition, start to think. And it may be that gift acknowledgement, you know that e-newsletter, it goes there, it goes there, it goes there. So it's fine to have multiple on the same one, but then this is where you also add in personalization. So in addition to e-newsletter, and I realize that's more of informative communication, so thank you for bearing with me, but maybe this is letter. Then this is also gonna be hand sign. And for this, it's gonna be letter, hand sign, call within two weeks. That's how I do it. So I would go through and kind of add, do the different ones, right? What's the personalization? And then for the last one, this is where you just time it out. You look up here at the activities that you sketched out and you put them into the timeline. Okay, I know that if I wanna try a town hall, I'm gonna do it in February and I'm gonna invite major level only, town hall, right? And then after this, you take this, you plug it into Excel. This is your timeline. And it can very easily incorporate with your existing development plan, or this can literally become your development plan if you don't have anything ready yet. Any questions from folks before Molly breaks you out? Okay, we've got 23 minutes. I just wanna make sure and get you out of here on time so that we've got time to come back together. So you'll have the countdown clock at some point um, and you'll be pushed back into the big room right before we wrap, okay? Okay, welcome back to everybody. The first thing I wanna say is, I am sorry that I did not make it into all the breakouts. Um, so I want to reserve this time. We just have a couple of more minutes for kind of debrief final questions. Um, so I just want to reserve a couple of minutes now, particularly for the groups I didn't make it in. If you've got questions that you guys were holding for me or that you would like answered, if it's a quick answer, I'm happy to do it now. If not, I'm going to give you my email at the end and you and can definitely reach out. So who's got anything they, and you feel free to put it in the chat box or unmute and ask. I was uh, in one of the groups, uh, Glenn Hopkins here from Hopkins House. I was, I was in one of the groups and I was just in the middle of, it, of apparently insulting uh, 65 year olds and above. Um, but I mean this in, in that I was trying to find out from Carolyn and Lauren and Leslie who were on the call uh, with me about how they did their fundraising digitally and got a really good response, or at least Lauren I think did. And um, I was curious because we've had just the opposite uh, action. Our older donors tend to prefer paper and our younger donors tend to give digitally, but um, Lauren was having a different experience. I was just wondering and wondering how she was able to get the kind of experience she got 
uh, for 65 year olds uh, using digital responses. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, the general rule of thumb that I think you're hitting on is that for a lot of organizations that do keep direct mail, it's because they have an older donor set that either is more comfortable replying via mail or it's just what they're used to because it's what the organization has always done. Um, I do think most nonprofits are seeing a higher online giving percentage, even if it's the letter that triggers it and then you actually just make your gift online. I've also got a lot of nonprofits this year that they encouraged people to go online knowing that we were expecting mail delays, postal service problems, et cetera. And also because a lot of staff aren't in offices and then there's a need to check the mail and there's a whole thing. So a lot of nonprofits I saw did a really good job still sending the mail piece, but encouraging the online gift in a way that felt more robust than previous years. But what I will say, I mean, I worked with um, an organization in DC years ago and they have one of the oldest direct mail programs in the city. They're a domestic violence organization and they still raise the vast majority of their money via direct mail. And so for some people, I don't think it will ever leave. And that's because it is what's comfortable to the donor. And so I always think, think of it from a donor perspective. When, when we say we're a donor centric organization, it means we think from their perspective and we provide what they need based on what they tell us or how they behave. So it would be great. Who wouldn't love to get rid of mail costs? But at the end of the day, if you are an organization that still receives a lot of donations via mail, I wouldn't because I don't think that in the minds of the donor that they would appreciate it or the transition would be fully made. And if you're an organization that has a lot of 65 plus donors, man, I'd be mailing to them even more. I'd be like, what's my three-part plan giving arc that I can plan for 2021 or IRA distribution or like it triggers in me all these other ideas that I think um, are usually received well or at least partially via mail. So I hope that answers a bit. Um, what other questions? Any other questions? Okay. I have one. Oh, yes, Genesis. Um, so for monthly donors, right, like a lot of monthly donors at like 10 or 15 or 20 bucks, right, they stay in kind of one category, but then for, and do you treat them differently than you would treat someone else who gave like that lump sum all at once? Um, and then we also have some monthly donors who do give like 80 or $150 a month they, I'm assuming, get lumped into the major donor category. Um, so how do you treat monthly donors differently or do you just treat it by the sum of what they're giving annually? If you have the bandwidth, I would treat them as their own segment. Now, if there are some monthly donors that are way higher that cumulative, cumulatively, it's really quite a bit of money, I would also incorporate some of the major donor strategies with them. But if possible, I find monthly donors appreciate slightly different strategies. Knowing that they're giving every month, maybe they get also like a quarterly, you know, donor report just for monthly donors. They're like, there's lots of kind of neat ideas. They don't have to be really time intensive because in essence, all the monthly donors are gonna get the same thing, right? But like, tell them they're a special group. Tell them that you appreciate their continued support and all of those kinds of things. But I would treat them differently. And then within the monthly donors, there's maybe a handful that could also get some major donor type strategies. Okay. With that, I'm going to pause and I'm just going to share with you um, for what it's worth, just my last slide, which just kind of wraps it up. And so what would I do if I were you from here? This is what I would do. The first is, if you can, use that stewardship template. Like I said, I would put it in Excel personally, but use it in some way, even if it's just a brainstorming technique and then really you dump everything into your normal development plan, right? Finalize that to some extent if you're able. And then I would complete your year-end donor acknowledgement in January. So in my mind, and I do think that there's a lot of leeway at the moment with donors, mail problems, you know, nonprofits are, of course, planning and doing many things. In my mind, 
your year-end acknowledgements and all of those, the personalization, the letters, the phone calls, have them done by the end of the month because then we pretty quickly need to pivot. We need to get out of gift acknowledgement mode and into like informative communications mode. Be sure and incorporate spring to action. I know Brandy said the registration just opened. So get signed up for that April 28th, work it into your plans. And then if you do have lingering questions, because we didn't have quite as long as I wanted at the end um, to answer everyone's, that is my email, susan at kellystrategies.com, super easy. Feel free to send me an email and I will get back to you. So that's it for me and um, Brandy and Molly, I will turn it back to you. Wonderful. Thanks, Susan. And thank you all for being here today. We really appreciate your time. Um, hopefully now you have some homework to do and we'll get work busy working on that, that plan and that template. Um, again, we're so grateful for Susan and her expertise and really breaking it down into a way that's like manageable and easy to understand. And so hopefully this will kind of help inform your stewardship from here on out. Um, and again, take advantage. If you have questions, please reach out to Susan. She is so kind and generous to offer her email and to answer questions. So I encourage you to do that. And we will be back in touch as we have more spring to action uh, to share in the next couple weeks. All right, thank you again. And we'll send out an email with the survey, with the slides and other resources. So take care and we'll see you all soon. Thank you everyone. Have a great year. Bye. Bye.